recording off. We will be recording. I'm just gonna wait a few minutes to let folks trickle in. Um, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Just gonna wait a few more minutes to let more folks come in here. Kami Dakiyatri, my name is Michela. Dayaya Hippi, Dayan Wanchianke. It's uh, welcome. It's so good to see you all. Very excited for tonight's program. I think that we can get started now. We have a bunch of folks in here already. That's so lovely. Um, okay. Well, Hamidakiatbi, Chante Washte Anapche Chius Apie, Michelle Bowman Amakiatbie. Sisituan Kawach Betu Oyate Himatahan. Dayaya Hippi, I'm Patuk de Nina Iomakbie. Hello, my relatives. My name is Michelle Bowman. I am Dakota from the Sisitin Wapatin Oyate. I come from the Wana Tioshpae. Um, I am going to be your MC for tonight's uh, Gifts of the Plant Nation webinar, where we will be exploring the topics of chanshasha uh, or our traditional tobacco. Um, Gifts of the Plant Nation is a program that Lower Phelan Creek Project hosts um, about one per season now, where each season, one plant relative, one plant medicine will be chosen to um, talk about and explore. So we bring in Dakota cultural educators to tell us the stories of these plant relatives and all of their gifts. Our plant nation, they give so much to us um, from food to shelter, um, to clean air, they clean our soil. Um, and this program was really brought to fruition to uh, give thanks to all the gifts of our plant nation while also spreading knowledge um, in our language and from our elders. Um, my name is Michela. For people that are just trickling in, um, I used to work for Lower Phelan Creek Project for a number of years, and this program is really special to me and important. Um, it's so lovely that we get to share these teachings about our plant relatives and the plant nations. Um, if we can go to the next slide, tonight we're going to be talking about chanshasha. Um, in our language, chan is our word for tree and sha means red. So chanshasha means that really, really red tree or that really, really red bark. And for those of you that do know or might not know, chanshasha is our word for traditional tobacco. Um, this wonderful graphic that you see here was created by um, Shana Elk, and part of this program was to not only have uh, one plant medicine or relative per season to talk about, to talk about and uplift, but we also wanted the graphics to be created by uh, Dakota women so that we could support them in their works and efforts. Um, so towards the end, we can talk about this more, but if you go to Lower Phelan Creek Project, their website, you can buy a bunch of merch, cups, mugs, um, shirts that have a lot of the medicines um, for, for this program. Um, so tonight, we're really excited to talk about Chanshasha. We can go to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to say, Wopira uh, Tankar, many thanks to our sponsors. This activity is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Um, so Wopida, thank you to all those who've donated to Lower Phelan Creek Project and helped make programs like this possible. And if we can go to the next slide, I would love to also extend a giant thank you to all of the Lower Phelan Creek Project staff that are making this webinar possible tonight. Um, we're definitely still in the ages of sharing information through webinars and with that comes tech support. So thank you so much to all of LPCP staff for helping to make this webinar run smoothly. I also wanted to say Wopira Tanka and thank you to our indigenous knowledge keepers in our communities that continue to pave this path for us to learn our culture and our traditions that we may share them with ourselves and each other in our community and the community at large. I also wanna say Wopira Tanka, thank you to our ASL interpreters that are with us tonight. This was a really big um, part of the program when we were creating Gifts of the Plant Nation that we wanted to bring in our ASL interpreters so that we can increase the accessibility in our community. Um, 
and we are very lucky and grateful and honored to have them here with us tonight. Um, and so next, I would love to introduce our speakers, if we could move to the next slide. Tonight, we are going to be hearing from uh, the some of my favorite Indigenous women, our women uh, powerhouses, who love plants just as much as we all do. And so um, to begin our evening, we'll, we will hear from our cultural knowledge keeper, Fern Renville, who just joined Lower Failing Creek Project as their Dakota Cultural Educator and Program Coordinator. Fern is from the Sisseton Wapitan Oyate and is Dakota. And then following Fern and her storytelling, where she will talk about Chanshasha and some of our Dakota stories, we'll hear from Jenna Gray Eagle, who is Lower Failing Creek Project's environmental justice educator and stewardship coordinator, and is Oglala Lakota. And she will be sharing um, different ways that Chanshasha or tobacco. Um, is used by our communities and their medicinal benefits and some other really lovely um, facts. And then we'll hear from Gabby Minoman, who is Lower Failing Creek Project's restoration manager in his Forest County Potawatomi. And she's going to be sharing some really cool um, science, Indigenous science and the Western science and how to um, harvest and plant and transplant chanshasha and tobacco and um, other um, elements to learning about tobacco. And so without further ado, I'm really excited to hand it off to Tumi Fern to share some stories about uh, chanshasha with us tonight. Fern, if uh, you would like to go, thank you so much for being here. Mm. Hello, my beautiful relatives. Thank you all for joining us online here. I'm so excited. This is my first time officially as a member of the Lower Phelan Creek team, and it just feels really wonderful. So, um, like um, Michela, Sisituan Wapetuan Oyate Hemataha, also from the Lake Traverse Reservation, Mihunkake. Um, Rob Renville, uh, Jan Salazar, um, and uh, my grandparents were Joseph and Naomi Renville, and um, I'm a flute player, <laughs> among other things, just learning this flute. But <clears throat> um, we're going to talk about Chanshasha. We are not going to talk about the ceremonial uses of Chanshasha for a general audience because that is um, uh, that's intellectual spiritual property that um, we don't need to share. Before we start, though, I want to say that um, Native people who are interested can join myself and Jenna and Nikki Buck at Prairie Island on Saturday morning, where we will be able to go hiking and harvest some chanshasha and learn more about that medicine and ceremony uses of the plant. But tonight we're going to talk more generally about chanshasha and what chanshasha means. So I am going to start by playing this flute, this um, traditional six hole flute. It has these four holes around the bottom. And I was told that that represents the four directions. So Chanshasha has a traditional association with the four directions. And so let me play you some music. And like I said, I am learning. <laughs> That is a song called Dakota Love Song that was written for the flute by my ancestor, Joseph Renville. 
back in the day and I'm still <laughs> learning to play it. So that song, because these, this flute and the sacred breath that is used to play it connects me to our entire mythic story tradition. All the Dakota stories are connected one to another and they're connected to us and they're connected to all of creation. So our stories connect us to um, our mythic stories and they connect um, us to um, all of our other relatives in this world that we share here in the um, in our homelands. So Chanshasha, Chanshasha is a um, sacred medicine plant. Now, some people like to share the story of white buffalo calf woman around Chanshasha teachings because some people say that she brought us, that's one of the medicines she brought us. There are other stories that mention Chanshasha as a plant that grew along the water after uh, a young person, and usually in the story it's a young man, is either drowned or somehow lost in the water. And where he is lost, praying for his people, this plant with beautiful red branches would come up. And the people knew that was medicine from this person who had um, lost their life praying. Those are very short stories. <laughs> so I want to tell you a longer story too that connects back to um, all of our other teachings. So Chanshasha and the Four Directions. So all of our um, Dakota way of life is in response to um, the stars up above us. The stars above us, the heavens with the moon and stars, constellations, tell us where we are in our year and where we are in our um, sacred rhythms and cycles and reminds us that as Dakota people, we are children of the stars. We are relatives of the stars. We're star people. So we do things here on earth according to the stars up above. As it is above, so it is below. That speaks to that Dakota um, value of, of balance, where you're finding this sweet place to live between the spirit world and this physical world. So long ago, before um, humans came along, life here on this planet on mother earth was much more chaotic a long time ago there was not yet a, a set length of day or set length of time for a year and the directions were constantly changing because the winds were completely undependable and just went all around the world wherever they wanted well these winds that i'm talking about these winds were the four sons of Tate the wind. Now these four sons had grown up kind of in exile with their father, following a very long and dramatic story in which their mother Ite was turned into a kind of scary monster, a double-faced woman, Anugite, and sentenced to an exile on earth. That's another story. <laughs> but this story is about how um, at this time when Tate and Ite's four sons came of age, when they were becoming young men now and ready to do their work in the world, Ska, the great power, told Wazi, the old man, their grandfather, that it was now time for um, Tate to let his four sons know what their work in this world was going to be. And so Ska told Wazi, who told Tate, who told his four sons, <laughs> that the work of these four young men 
the um, north wind, Waziata, the south wind, Idokaha, the west wind, uh, Wilhepeata, the east wind, Wilhepeata. These four sons were given the work by their creator to now circle the world for all eternity. Each one of them would now establish and choose a cardinal direction. And now for all eternity, they would travel the planet around and around the world. And in so doing, they would establish um, order. They would bring harmony and they would bring um, dependability. And so Skan told them, you must travel around the world. And when you come back to the same spot in which you started, a year's time will have passed. And you will just pass that mark and you will keep going for all eternity. And this was to establish order in the world so that once again here on earth, we were responding to the order and harmony in the sky world and with our star relatives. So, <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> Those four sons, Tate's four sons, they went to bed that night <clears throat> and prepared to go out on the prairie the next day. They were going to establish a camp and set out the day after to um, do these, do this work that had been given to them. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, Scott also told them, when you establish your direction, for instance, north wind, because you're the oldest Waziata, you will go first and you will establish north, which is as far from the warmth as the sun as possible. And there you will put down a cairn, a pile of rocks that mark a significant place for Dakota people. And so um, these young um, sons of Tate all had a direction to choose and they were all prepared to do this work. So the next day they went out and they set up a teepee, a lodge that they were going to um, leave out of the next morning. That night, as it was getting dark and they were getting ready to um, eat a little food and go to bed, those young men saw their grandfather, Wazi, the old man, the first old man, appeared outside their lodge. Now, typically when um, any visitor, but in particular like an esteemed grandfather, would arrive at a teepee lodge, it would be the work of the oldest son to respectfully invite in that um, honored guest who would come and sit in just the right or place inside the um, lodge that showed that they were an esteemed guest. And there, of course, they would be offered food and a warm place by the fire and so on. But that's not what happened. Northwind, very grumpily, didn't even invite his grandfather in and his younger brothers were embarrassed. But they said nothing until finally Southwind couldn't bear it any longer. And he said, Grandfather, come in, come in and sit by me, <gasps> sit by me, by the fire. Now, Southwind had only a very small and kind of thin buffalo robe. And his grandfather, he had to scoot over so that his grandfather would fit on it. But when his grandfather sat down next to him on that buffalo robe, it suddenly grew big. It grew big and plush and warm. Now it was plenty big for the both of them. Now, now the um, north wind pulled out his bag of dried meat, his washna, and he started eating it without even offering his poor hungry grandfather who'd been traveling some food. Oh, that looks really good, Takoja grand, grandson. You um, surely can share some with me, your hungry grandfather. Oh, said North Wind. When someone as wise and old as you goes traveling, you'd think you'd have packed some of your own food. Well, this wasn't very polite. And once again, 
Waziata, Northwind's brothers, were embarrassed by his behavior. And Southwind said, oh, grandfather, come and sit by me, or, or uh, come and sit closer and I'll share my bag of meat with you. Now, Southwind, uh, Idokaha, did not have a lot of meat in his bag, not as much as Northwind did. And he only had a little and he thought, oh, I'd better give the you know, first of it to my grandfather here. And that's what he did. He handed over his bag so that his grandfather could eat before he ate anything. And his grandfather ate all that meat and he kept eating. He kept pulling out more and more washna, that dried meat. And when he was done eating his fill, he handed the bag back to Itokaha, South Wind. And South Wind looked inside there and it was completely full. Now, ever since then, South Wind has been associated with warmth and lots of food. Mm -hmm. And to this day, animals go to the South in the wintertime and the warmth is there. Now, finally they went to bed, they went to sleep. And when they woke up the next morning, this grandfather said to his four grandsons, my four grandsons, I actually have a gift for each of you that's going to help you in this work that has been given with you, or given to you. You're gonna to have to keep going around the world again and again. So I made you these moccasins, each of you. And he took out those moccasins and he gave them to his four grandsons. And he said, these moccasins will allow you to run so fast without growing tired. I think you'll really appreciate having them. Well, the grandsons all put them on their feet and excitedly started heading out the door, but not Waziata, not Northwind. He said, I don't know, what are you saying? That I'm not fast enough? That I need special moccasins? He was kind of a mistrustful and sort of grumpy person. And he wasted a lot of time finally accepting those moccasins and putting them on. By then his brothers were on their way. Oh, said his grandfather, Wazi, the old man, look at how hot the day is getting. Waziata, I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to make the sky nice and cloudy because it's no fun traveling in this heat. And so Waziata headed out under this gray sky and it was nice and cool, but it was also really hard to know which direction was north when there were clouds. So as it turns out, Waziata found what he thought was true north, as far from the south and the sun as he could go. So he put down his cairn, his pile of rocks to show that this was an important place. This was true north. So then the old man Wazi caught up with him and said, oh, now that you found your direction, I will take away these clouds and have the sun come back. And so that's what happened. And Waziata's brothers also were there now. They were all together. And as the sun came back out, they could all see that this was not true north. In fact, if anything, it was true west. Waziata had placed his rocks right where west wind was supposed to put his, on the place where the sun goes down into the prairie. That is where Waziata, Northwind's rocks were. Well, Wazi made Waziata move that pile of rocks. Go find true north like you've been told by Ska. And so Waziata very grumpily went and placed his um, rocks where they were supposed to be. But Westwind, uh, Will Chepeata, had put his rocks now where Northwind had placed his. That was where his cairn was supposed to go. And so now Wazi, the old man, said, 
to Real Hippiata. From now on, West Wind, you will go first because your older brother has forfeited his birthright. As the oldest son, he would naturally have the privilege of going first, but no longer. And so today in things like um, when we have pipe ceremonies and other um, kinds of um, recognition, we have, um, we always recognize West Wind first. So, um, where was I going with this? Oh yes, so, um, um, South Wind, Idokaha placed his rocks down where they were supposed to be. His cairn marking truth south was as far from Wajiata as he could get and as close to the sun as possible. East Wind, Wiohin Piata, placed his pile of rocks where the sun rises out of the earth in the morning. And so these four cardinal directions were established, and now the four directions began their work. North headed north, south headed south, east went east, and west traveled west. And they traveled around the earth for a whole year before reaching that same spot. And ever since, the length of our days and years has been reliable and the directions we know which way they're going which way they are they're fixed we know which way is north which way is south and so these four directions made the world more harmonious and orderly because they knew that that's the kind of world we need to live in in order to be good relatives to one another so that story tells me about how Dakota people are connected to our star relatives and our star knowledge and all of our um, seasonal cyclical rhythms that um, our ceremonies and um, that our um, practices are embedded in respond once again to the sky, to the constellations, to the movement of the stars. And right now we're in the Twin Cities and it's a very cloudy evening, but even if it was clear, I probably wouldn't be able to see the stars like my ancestors could see the stars on the prairie before development of the prairie. Um, so our star knowledge is our plant knowledge as well. Once again, our, star, our plant knowledge came to us from the star people. That's another story and I will share that with you another time. I, I want to um, turn you over now to um, Michela, who's going to introduce our next host. But I just wanted to say thank you for letting me tell this story. Ah, thank you so much, Fern. I love hearing you talk and share these stories so much. Um, I feel like the, the winter time can be so dark and ominous and cold, but it also is a great reminder that it's storytelling season and also that um, that chashasha ipusia or that uh, constellation that's up in the stars that tells us when it's time to harvest it always fills me back up with life. Um, sometimes I get so sad when our plant relatives are sleeping, but then I remember that in the winter, we it's time to harvest our tobacco or chanshasha. Um, and as people from the Wichach Bioyat there, the Star Nation, I love that connection so much. And I just thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you know, sometimes we get so distracted or we have these jobs that we have to do and kids we have to take care of and, and all that stuff, but our medicines and our plant relatives and our stories remind us to slow down and really be with each other. And that's one of my favorite things about um, learning about and harvesting chanshasha or tobacco. Um, this program is called Gifts of the Plant Nation um, because our plant relatives, they have so much to give us. They have so many gifts 
for us and so much spirit for us. And um, Chanshasha is our way, our tobacco is our way to give thanks and offerings and prayers back to the plant nations and our relatives. And so it just fills my heart up so much to, to be here with all of you to um, talk about our really important uh, plant medicines and Chanshasha being one of the four sacred plant relatives and medicines that we have. And it just feels so special to be here tonight um, to share those things. Um, uh, the next part of our evening, which is one of my favorite parts, I am also so impressed by our next speaker all the time. As Native people, we have always been um, not only storytellers, but scientists. And so this next section, I'm going to hand it off to um, Gabby Manoman to talk about the ecological role and environmental knowledge when it comes to Chanshasha. Um, it's also called Red Osier Dogwood. And I'm really excited to learn more from this Mia, who is uh, from the Forest County Potawatomi community. <laughs> so Gabby, I'm going to hand it off to you, love. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Gabby Manoman. Um, I come uh, from Wisconsin, from the Forest County Potawatomi community up there in the north. Um, but I've been living here in the Twin Cities over the past almost eight years now. Um, and yeah, here at Lower Phelan Creek Project, I am the restoration manager. So, you know, I'm like the plant lady here. Um, so I'm always super excited to talk about our plant, our plant relatives. Um, so yeah, uh, so today we're talking about um, Tanshasha or uh, Red Osier Dogwood. Um, it's got a couple different names. If we wanna go to the next slide. All right, so um, this plant goes by a couple different main names. Um, it's uh, called uh, red osier dogwood, also called red willow, although it is not actually part of the willow family. It is part of the uh, Corneaceae family, which is the dogwood family. The willow family um, is, uh, their family is called uh, the Salix family. Um, so they're a little bit different, but they are related in some ways. Um, so, the scientific name is Cornicericae. Um, other members of the dogwood family uh, that are found here in Minnesota are called, or some of them are called uh, gray dogwood. We have bunchberry, which grows in uh, some of the wetland areas, and there's also gray dogwood. And um, so red, red willow can be found in a couple different plant habitats. It really enjoys um, moist wet soil um, somewhere where it can have easy access to water so they're often found um, along wetland bottoms in drainages or drainage areas um, riparian zones um, and near streams and creeks and stuff like that but they are also found in forests woodlands shrub thicklets and even sand dunes um, and a little fun fact about them they are an indicator species for not only um, wet soil, but also basic soil. And they're also a really good indicator that um, if you see red willow growing somewhere, good chances are the soil is very high um, in nitrogen. Okay, um, let's see. Another, another quick fun fact about um, red willow is that it is extremely cold hardy. So if we look on the map here, it is found um, in multiple different areas in the United States. Um, it is a little bit restricted by the heat. Um, so that's why it's not really found too much in the Southwest or sorry, Southeast. But um, getting back to its more Northern uh, region. So red willow is extremely cold hardy. They can survive temperatures of up to, or yeah, up to negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and there have actually been studies done where they took red willow clippings and put them in liquid nitrogen and um, were able to plant them in soil and they re-sprouted, which is really, really an amazing gift that they have. Um, as long as the plant tissue itself isn't damaged, um, red willow will come back and grow 
um, in multiple different um, environments. So yeah, really, really amazing gift that this plant has also. All right, if we can go to the next one. All right, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how to identify red willow. What does red willow look like? So um, given, by, uh, given the name, uh, red willow has this really bright red bark. And actually the bark, as it ages, it turns a little bit more of a brown red. It kind of loses that really vibrant red color. But you see that really, really bright red color on the new stems um, quite often. And if you look down at that bottom right picture, you can just see how vibrant it can be in the landscape, especially during um, the times of the year where the other vegetation um, has dropped their leaves. So um, talking about the form of red willow, what does red willow look like exactly when it's growing in its environment? So it is a multi-stemmed uh, woody plant. Um, so you're gonna have multiple main stems uh, all branching from the same uh, location, and they're going to have their own little branches coming off of that. Um, they also form these really dense thickets, as you can also see by the uh, bottom right uh, photo. And a lot of times, I've, I've, I've seen this a couple of times where people call red osier dogwood or red willow um, an invasive species, which is interesting to me because it is a native plant species to the area. And I think where they're coming from with that is that red willow can be considered aggressive um, where it grows just because it does like to grow in these dense thickets and it grows very, very well in the environments that it's put in generally. Um, so yeah, um, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, also, um, I'll talk about this a little bit um later but um with these dense thickets um it's pretty and with and with red willow being a multi-stem uh plant it's pretty um easy to be able to harvest from um from the plant as long as you're not um damaging the root system and you generally want to leave the very young twigs and those main um stems that are coming out of the ground alone um but if when you recut them they they resprout um relatively well. Um, they're really good at forming new branches for the next year. When they're cut, they're, um, they react very readily to um, disturbances. All right, and then, so I'm gonna talk about the leaves a little bit. So if you look in that upper right-hand photo, um, you can see um, pretty well what the leaves look like. So they're gonna be kind of this um, ovate, oval shape um, with a, pretty narrow point at the top. Um, if you look at the veins, the veins all come together at the point of the leaf. The edges are, um, the botany term, they call it the entire edges. So the edges are very smooth. There's no teeth on the edges of them. Um, and they are this very beautiful, vibrant green. Um, moving on to the flowers. So the flowers are these, um, white bunches of flowers that grow together. Pollinators love them. They're really popular with bees and other insect pollinators. Um, and red willow flowers in the early spring and it can flower all the way into um, August too. I've seen them flowering um, pretty late in the season also. Um, and then the berries, the berries are these beautiful white berries. Um, you can eat the berries. They are pretty bitter though. I've had them before. Not my favorite personally, but you can eat the berries. Um, and so the berries are white. They can be this kind of um, very faded green color. And some of them even have almost a, an, a blue tint to them. And when the berries form, they form in these things called droops, um, which is just kind of the next step from after the uh, the bunch flowers, you know, the bunch flowers turn into berry droops. So that is um, how we identify red willow. If we want to move on, so I want to talk a little bit about kind of the makeup um, of the stem, and some of this term terminology may help later. Um, so. Um, 
one really cool thing that Red Willow does, and this goes into why this is kind of like a scientific look as to why um, harvest happens in the winter. So when the plant is getting ready um, to go into dormancy for the winter, it actually takes the sap from its wood and it will transfer it to the roots. And so this, this sap that the plant has, um, and when it's transferring the sap into the roots, um, this is a way for it to store nutrients. So the, um, the sap that runs through um, the stem uh, goes through the phloem here, which is the living part of the plant. Um, and so that's what, when referring to the inner bark, that's the phloem and this cambium later, layer. The cambium is what actually um, allows the plant to grow. That's the other living part of it. Um, yeah, so that's that. Oh, and when the um, when it does transfer the sap to the roots as it's getting ready to go into dormancy, it actually makes the bark less bitter also. If we wanna go to the next slide. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to plant red willow. So there's a couple different options when, when, uh, when planting red willow. Um, first one being planting it from seed. I've processed red willow um, seeds a couple times in my life for other restoration projects that I've been a part of. Um, all you have to do is get that fleshy, uh, the fleshy layer off of the seed and make sure that none of the um, berry flesh is still on the seed. Let it dry out and store it in a very cold area, fridge, freezer, before um, you plant it. You generally leave it in the fridge or freezer for about a month. Um, and if you can leave it and if you can leave it in there over the winter, that's completely fine. They'll be ready in the spring, but they need that um, cold moist stratification to germinate in the summer and the springtime. Um, the other way that you can plant red willow is by um, getting potted plants from a nursery. That's always an option too. I will say if you get potted plants from a nurse nursery, since you're working with a woody plant, you wanna make sure that um, when you put it into the ground, you're not putting the soil um, past that, the very top root, um, because um, red willow especially, but um, just woody plants in general, um, they, have, they, they have these things called adventitious roots. So when you plant, when you put soil where um, further up the stem where it's not supposed to be, it'll grow these roots out from what should have been the bottom of the stem. And, um, eventually it can lead to uh, reduced nutrient uptake. It can actually choke out the plant later in its life. Um, so I just, I always wanna say that when planting woody plants, make sure you find that the, the, the root that is furthest um, up the stem and don't plant, um, don't, don't put your soil above that root. So another way that you can plant red willow is by clippings. So, um, as I was kind of talking about before, when you go to harvest uh, red willow, um, you want to make sure you don't take the really young stems. You want to make sure you don't want to take those main uh, those main stems that are coming from uh, directly from the ground. Um, and when you cut these stems, um, generally the rule for cutting woody stems is to cut them at a 45 degree angle. Um, and all you have to do with this, and this is a really good um, depiction, that bottom picture here of those adventitious roots. Um, so you want to put them uh, in some water where they have access to a lot of moisture and they will grow these adventitious roots and they will even start sprouting. Like if you were to gather them in the winter uh, when they don't have leaves, they'll start sprouting if you put them in the water. And um, Basically, all you have to do after that is plant them in the ground, uh, making sure those roots are um, under the soil and um, making sure that they get enough water also. Because if you're taking them directly from a water source to the soil, you wanna make sure that the soil is still staying um, as moist as possible to um, help these clippings reroot. But the beautiful thing about red willow is it's, uh, with it being cold hardy, it is also just generally hardy to the environments that it grows in. Um, it's one of, it's a very great plant to work with in terms of restoration because it will establish relatively quickly to the environment. It likes to, it'll hold on pretty well um, in the environment you put it in as long as it's the appropriate environment um, with enough 
moisture in the soil. Okay, if we wanna to go to the next slide. So I'm gonna talk about some of the ecological roles that red willow plays in the environments that it lives in. So just a quick recap, they really like moist environments such as riparian zones along uh, waterways and uh, drainages, anywhere where you can find really um, nice nutrient rich moist soils. Um, so red willow is very important um, for wildlife species. Um, pretty much every part of the plant can be utilized in some way for our animal relatives. So the berries um, are eaten by small mammals such as squirrels and chipmunks. Um, the birds also really love the berries as well. Um, the inner bark in the winter, I've seen um, I've seen some browse. Um, it, sometimes if you look in the winter and you look on the snow line right next to a woody shrub, you can kind of see an area where it looks like something's been eating away at the um, at the willow. And that's usually something like rabbits or chipmunks or even voles. And what they're doing there is they're eating that inner bark, that inner cambium layer. And it's really great browse for them in the winter because it is a lot less bitter um, in the winter times and it's a good source of nutrients as well. The inner bark of red willow is very high in a lot of different nutrients. Um, and then our larger animal relatives such as deer and elk and moose, they will um, eat the twigs in the winter as well. Um, again, because they are pretty um, high in nutrients with that inner uh, cambium and phloem layer. And then also because uh, the red willow grows in these dense thickets, it provides really great um, shelter and nesting habitats for a number of different um, small mammals as well. And as I was kind of, I kind of mentioned this a little bit when I was talking about the flowers, but uh, pollinators really love these flowers. You can find all sorts of bees and wasps, beetles, butterflies, and um, even flies that come and visit these flowers when they're blooming. And another great gift that red willow has in the environment, and I mentioned how it's really great for restoration because it generally establishes very well in the environment you put it in. Um, so they're great for like the first, first stages and restoration, especially if you're trying to reduce um, erosion and create some bank stabilization. And because they do grow in those, um, those thickets together, that's, what, that's part of the reason um, that they are able to help so much with erosion and um, bank stabilization as well because the root systems work together to hold that soil together. And I think that's really, really beautiful. Um, I think that's all that I had for this section. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it back to Michelle. Uh, thank you so much, Gabby. I feel like I learned so much. <laughs> I love this section of uh, the Gifts of the Plant Nation program um, because it teaches me so much about um, Native folks and our traditional views and understanding of science and the environment. I thought it was so interesting what you said about um, a lot of non-native folks thinking that chanshasha or red willow is invasive or is, is an invasive species due to it just um, wanting to bunch up and be near um, each other. It made me think a lot about the whole reason Gifts of the Plant Nation was started. A few years ago, we started this program because a lot of the um, neighboring land managing agencies here in Imanijaska or St. Paul um, well, to back up, uh, Lower Failing Creek Project is a Native-led organization doing um, really amazing cultural and environmental work here in Imanijaska or St. Paul, and specifically working out of a sacred site called uh, Wakantipi for, no, for anybody who may not know. And the Gifts of the Plant Nation program was started um, a few years ago because we were working with some folks um, in different city agencies, land managing agencies, um, that believed cottonwoods were an invasive species and treated them so poorly. Um, but us as Dakota people, cottonwoods, um, they connect us to the Wichakfil Yakir, the Star Nation, and they have so many gifts to give. So we brought in an elder, Jim Red Eagle, to talk about the cottonwoods and the gifts and their medicinal benefits and their um, environmental um, 
uses and just ways they work. And I feel the same way about Chan Shasha. Um, and it makes me think uh, how special and important and powerful um, indigenous ecological knowledge is and the traditions that we have and that knowledge that we have that's been passed down for generations. So many of our plant relatives rely on um, relationships with us as two-leggeds or as humans. And um, it makes it, it makes me so happy that we're talking about these things because um, I think Western or white conservation was started not only uh, um, by Theodore Roosevelt, who said the only good Indian is a dead one, um, but under the premise that humans need to be removed um, from the environment in order for the environment to thrive, which is simply not true. Um, if you take into account um, the thousands of years of knowledge that our communities have taking care of our plant relatives and being in reciprocal relationships. Um, and it's the same with Chanshasha. Chanshasha grows so much and it's, um, we help Chanshasha thrive by harvesting it. Um, so it made me think so much about that when you said that and how important it is to have Native folks at the, not only at the table, but uh, more often leading those conversations around how to, how do we best take care of our environments? Um, cause we know these things, um, a lot better. Um, so anyway, sorry for that tangent, but I think it was so, um, powerful what you said. So Wogura Tanka, thank you so much, Gabby for that. Um, and I am excited to present our next speaker, Jenna Gray Eagle, who is Oglala Lakota, will be talking about the many gifts and uses um, of chanshasha, our traditional tobacco. So I'm going to hand it off to you, Jenna. <clears throat> yep, thank you, Michelle. Um Kiapi na Pemato Amakiapi Oyatekin Ola Lakota Echiapi. Um so hello everyone. Um, my name is Jenna Gray Eagle. And I'm an enrolled member of the Oglala Lakota tribe um, of South Dakota. Um, and I'm also the environmental justice educator and the stewardship coordinator here at Lower Failing Creek Project. And I'm, I'm also, as along with everybody else, really happy to be here tonight and just to be talking with you all, um, especially about the uses of chinchasha, um, because it's just such a beautiful relative, as you can tell in the pictures, the color is unlike anything you see when you're out in hiking out in winter, once you see it, it is just so vibrant and beautiful. And it's, once you start looking for it, it just becomes so much more um, beautiful. And I wanted to expand um, kind of both about the cultural and the medicinal uses of Chinshasha and how the Ocheti Shikoi or the Seven Council Fires um, which includes the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota people um, have utilized this plant and how we still utilize this plant. Um, but because this is a more general audience, um, I'm not going to expand deeply at all about the cer ceremonial aspects of Chinchasha, um, as Fern said, because we feel that that's more suited for an Indigenous audience, um, in which I want to remind you that uh, we do have a hike and harvest event that is going to be focused on Chinchasha, specifically um, at the Prairie Island Indian Community uh, with Nikki Buck this Saturday, and that's from 10 to 2. And this event is specifically geared towards um, the Indigenous community here in the Twin Cities or, or close to the Twin Cities. Um, so that we, we do ask that you don't register if you're non-Indigenous. Um, and this is really just to help with like our own reclamation and um, so that we can all learn together more about how to harvest and process chinchasha, um, as well as hear about it from a cultural perspective, especially from a, a local Dakota community. Um, and um, the great leader, Nikki Buck, um, is so kind to be welcoming of, of, you know, any and all Indigenous people that are willing to come. So um, please check out our Facebook page um, to learn more about that. And <clears throat> uh, I think, um, yeah, we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, so I do, I do uh, want to talk a little bit about the cultural importance of Chinchasha to Dakota people. Um, and I am going to discuss it in conjunction with commercial tobacco, because there is a difference between commercial tobacco and traditional tobacco. So when you hear a Dakota person say traditional tobacco, what they actually mean is chinchasha, 
or um, red willow. And I think for Dakota people and Ocheti Shikoi or Seven Council Fire people in general, um, use Chinchasha for um, has become kind of an adaptation of what has happened to commercial tobacco, or sorry, commercial tobacco has become an adapt adaptation to, um, to how we used to use chinchasha. A lot of us have ended up using commercial tobacco um, because our way of life and our knowledge of how to harvest and process chinchasha was lost because it was illegal. And it was illegal until 1978 um, when the Religious Freedom Act passed. And so because it was illegal and not as easy to access as commercial tobacco, um, the, the addiction to commercial to tobacco has become a lot higher. And I think that the differences between the two, um, for one, um, commercial tobacco is highly addictive because it is inhaled and because it contains nicotine, um, whereas chinchasha was never inhaled whenever it was smoked. And, um, and, it, and it's not an addictive substance or it can't really be considered a substance at all because it, because it was never inhaled. Um, and commercial tobacco also has a ton of carcinogenic additives as we know. And I think it can also be very uh, considered very easy to access. Um, I think anybody over the age of 21 can very easily access commercial tobacco. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest difference between um, the way that tobacco is used now, um, the processing and harvesting of chinchasha is a much longer and a much more social process um, than just simply buying commercial tobacco. Um, and it was considered social because doing it together um, was you know it's easier to do things together and when you're harvesting and doing things within your community um, the processing of it um, becomes a social event whereas commercial tobacco kind of has become like a very much an individual choice or a personal choice and so when you see those murals or anything in Minneapolis that say tradition versus addiction this is what it's talking about it's talking about how um, the traditional tobacco um, is not necessarily like an addiction. Um, and also I just wanted to expand more too, like socially, chinchasha was used for things such as like the binding of a contract. It was also used um, kind of like as an offering or like a gift to an elder as a thank you to them. And it also used to be used for trade. And it was said that it was once so rare that you could trade a handful of it for an entire horse. Um, next slide, please. And uh, medicin med medicinally, I think it's important to note, as Gabby said, that um, because it's called red willow, a lot of people think that it contains um, salicin, which a lot of willows do contain salicin, which is a common ingredient in aspirin. But because, um, because chinchasha is actually not a true willow, it's a dogwood, um, and it doesn't contain um, um, the salicin that people co commonly seem to think. And it, I know it becomes confusing because um, people call it red willow, but um, because it's actually a dogwood, it actually contains um, something called coronic acid, which also can be considered a painkiller. Um, it's an alternative analgesic and it's not necessarily salicin, but it can still be used for a lot of the same things that you would use an aspirin for. So you can uh, make a tea out of the bark um, and you can use it for stomach aches or headaches. Um, muscle ailments, and it can also be used to clean cuts and burns and wounds. Um, and also um, a good kind of recipe too is that when you mix uh, chinchasha with sage, it's said that it can be really good for arthritis pain. Um, so yeah, just to um, kind of end my contribution here, I wanted to just remind you again of our um, Facebook event on uh, chinchasha hike and harvest with Nikki Buck this weekend. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Wopira Tanka. Pira Mayaya, Janan, this was so great. Um, I love uh, red willow tea. Uh, I think Maggie, the executive director for Lower Failing Creek Project, shared this tea recipe with me um, not too long ago. 
um, for really bad stomach aches that I think um, Jen, uh, Jim Red Eagle helped um, with as well. But that's um, a little bit of sage, a little bit of red willow, and a little bit of bear root. And if you um, make that pot of tea and you drink the whole thing, it should really help your tummy aches. Um, but also if you are a frequent peer, um, a red willow is also a diuretic. So it's gonna make you go. <laughs> so I thought um, that's kind of funny to share too. Um, but anyways, uh, thank you so much to all of our speakers. That was so amazing. Um, right now we're gonna jump into a brief uh, Q&A section. We might get done a little early. Um, so if you have any questions for our speakers and presenters, please feel free to put them in the chat, whether you're on Zoom or Facebook. It looks like we do have two or a handful of questions already, um, um, two that are geared towards uh, Gabby. Um, the first is when you were talking about uh, chanshasha or red willow indicating that there is a, a good amount of nitrogen in the soil. Can you maybe explain what that means? Is it good? Is it bad? Or what that indicates? Um, yeah, so essentially it just is an indicator that the soil is very healthy. Um, nitrogen can be something that um, is either um, not very abundant in a lot of different soil types or it is overabundant in the cases of like agriculture um, and stuff like that. So it just means that the soil is um, very healthy. It has a lot of organic material in it as well. Um, so that's a, it's essentially just indicating that like the riparian zone, the wet area that it's growing in has very healthy soil. Awesome. And then a question to kind of piggyback off that is, can a dogwood help cleanse nitrogen pollution from commodity cropping? We had that question in the chat. Uh, no, it cannot. It is not, um, it is not a nitrogen fixing uh, plant itself. Um, and that's kind of partially why it grows in these nitrogen rich areas is because it, it needs that um, high amount of nitrogen to grow well. Um, I don't know about for crop areas, but if you were to have a lot of nitrogen in the water and an alternative, and one that is actually nitrogen fixing is um, black alder. Those are those love to grow along streams, along ponds and creeks. So if you have a lot of nitrogen in those um, areas, that is a plant that will fix the nitrogen. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and then we have a, another question for Jenna. Um, can you use the outer bark of chanshasha for tea? Um, yes, that's, that's what I, that's what I'm under the, um, Gabby, I think you might know too. I think, can you use the inner bark for tea as well? Yeah, the inner bark, um, I know for my community, inner bark is used for um, stomach aches as well. There's like scientific research out there. There's research papers that explain more in depth why it, um, like the inner bark, inner bark specifically helps with um, stomach problems, but yeah, you can use outer or inner bark. And just for clarification for um, the folks that are tuning in tonight, when we harvest chanshasha, there's typically two, um, I don't know, two elements to it. We have the, the red outer bark, and then there's this greenish that ends up turning brown when it's dried inner bark. And so um, just to clarify for that, um, I think that is all our questions. I might... Oh, just kidding. I, I found out one more. Um, uh, can chanshasha be used in an oil or a salve for arthritis? If anybody knows the answer to this, this is a really lovely question because, um, you know, right now it's February. Uh, I'm going to go into a brief little tangent because we already talked about cottonwoods. Um, but cottonwood buds, right? Um, if you harvest those, they're really sticky, resinous about this time of year. Buds being the little, you know, knobs that you find on the trees before they turn into leaves. Right now is a really wonderful time to harvest cottonwood buds um, and to put them in a jar with some oil and then you create um, essentially what's a, a pain salve. So Jenna talked about this a little bit, but uh, trees like willows and cottonwoods are very hot 
I and Salison, or I never can pronounce that uh, word correctly, but I gave it my best shot. <laughs> but anyways, um, and the the same goes for a little a little amount for um, a red willow. Um, but cottonwood buds are really powerful medicine. I'm not sure personally um, if you could use the the outer bark for a salve, but I feel like it'd be a really lovely idea to try um, to combine the cottonwood buds with the the red willow bark. I think that sounds like a lovely combo. And one of my favorite ways to harvest cottonwood buds is about this time of year right now. Um, if there is a really big wind or snowstorm, just go out um, to find some cottonwoods. They really love to grow near the water too, um, closest to the rivers. And that way you can sustainably harvest those buds because um, a lot of times they just fall off the trees and they're just on the ground for you to go pick up and harvest put your chanshasha down, say your prayers, um, and then you can make some really great salve. And if you go to Lower Failing Creek Project's YouTube or website, you can find the Cottonwood or gifts of the Cottonwood webinar, where um, I talked about how to make a salve um, from the buds a few years ago. And then Jim Red Eagle, one of our elders, he also said that using grapeseed oil, um, is really great for making those pain salves um, in contrast to like sunflower or olive oil. Those are really great too for making salves. Um, we have, I'm, I'm, I hope that answered the question. I don't know if um, Jenna or Gabby has anything else to add for that um, in terms of chanshasha being used in an oil or a salve for arthritis, but those would be my recommendations. Um, if not, I can move on to the next question, which is, um, I'd love to know a little bit more about the chanshasha plants at Wakantipi. Um, have they been growing there naturally since uh, the beginning or were they planted as part of the restoration process? And how are they doing now? Um, just a tidbit, um, the willow at Wakantipi was established during restoration in 2004 when Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary um, turned into um, an official or moved from an official city dumping ground and went through a really large restoration process that was started in the late 90s and then that became established in 2004 and five as an official city park. And so that's when the, the Chanshasha plants at Wakantipi um, have been growing. And obviously our relatives were there before the destruction um, happened at Wakantipi. Um, just as, um, just to bring it back a bit, I think that we might have some participants here that don't know a whole lot about Wakantipi. Um, so Wakantipi is um, a Dakota sacred site here in Indonesia, Ska or St. Paul where we have one of our um, caves, Wakantipi cave, that our ancestors and relatives would go to to hold ceremony. And following the, the war, the Dakota War of 1862, a lot of our relatives were exiled from this area. And so we were no longer able to care for this place. Um, Wakantipi um, is, it rests right on the Hahawakpa or the Mississippi River. Um, so that's kind of that piece where Gabby talked about chanshasha loving to grow near water. I imagine that there used to be so much chanshasha or tobacco there at Wakantipi. But when our relatives were exiled in 1862, the railroad industry came in. St. Paul had a really large focus on industry. And unfortunately, Wakantipi was turned into an unofficial city dumping ground. Um, and the railroads blasted about three meters in with dynamite into our, our sacred cave. Um, but then luckily with a group of wonderful community members and a lot of our Hmong community members here in St. Paul, Lower Phelan Creek Project um, was put on a list uh, to help restore and bring back our plant relatives to that area. And so in I think Lower Failing Creek Project um, officially became an uh, organization in 1997. And so that work uh, thereafter began with um, Wakantipi, or its English name, I guess, Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary, becoming an official city park. Um, and really with a focus on uh, restoration there since about 50 tons of trash were removed in during that time period and then 13 tons of contaminated soil. And so that's also 
but why we host these things is because um, during that process, a lot of our Dakota community members weren't consulted about what plants to bring in um, to Wokan TV. But now with the leadership um, of this organization being native led and having a really large community come in um, to to better care for this place. A lot of our plant relatives are returning as well as our um, uh, our animal relative. I, I feel like in the last couple of years, we've had our first um, beavers and muskrats and eagles nests there for the first time in the last 50 years. And it's just really a testament to when we care about our plant relatives and when Shumaka or the earth, um, then our medicines come back and the animals come back. Um, and chanshasha being one of them. And so I would say that those chanshasha plants at Wakan Tipi, they're doing really well. Um, if you go there, you'll see a lot of our prayer ties left um, near there. There's one right by the cave and the pond or the pond. And so it it always makes my heart sore to see those. Um, and yeah, and to know that perhaps some of our community members are getting their medicines from that place too. Um, we have a couple more questions, which is great. Thank you so much. Please keep on sending them in. We have about till 7.30 if we really want. Um, but uh, uh, the next question is, are the flowers harvested and used for anything? Um, I'm gonna pass that off to LPCP uh, uh, staff members because um, that is also a question that I have. <laughs> so if anybody knows, please chime in. Um, I don't, I don't know specifically, but I, I did just want to mention too that, you know, for our community, um, from what I know too, is that, um, that the harvesting of chinchasha is usually only done, um, when the, uh, first frost happens and then before, um, before the first thunder beings, um, appear again, which is usually, you know, the spring equinox. Um, but as far as the flowers specifically, um, I don't, I don't know. Um, maybe Gabby or Fern know more about that. Um, no, I've never heard of flowers being used. It's um, pretty much just been the bark that people talk about. Lovely. And then we have another question um, that I think everybody like Fern and Gabby and Jenna could answer if you want to put your cameras on. Um, but this one is, would you consider putting down chanshasha as a closed practice? And I'm assuming that means maybe for non-native folks, but that could also be clarified further. But I'll repeat the question again. Would you consider putting down chanshasha a closed practice? That's a really good question. I think I'm probably struggling with it a little myself and I'm not sure that um, I'm ready to invite other folks to come and um, access this plant. Just right now, just because so many Dakota people haven't yet had a chance to develop a, a relationship with this plant relative, so. Um, I feel like at some point in our future, we're going to be a little more healed. And like Jenna mentioned, this is knowledge that literally was against the law to teach or share until the Religious Freedom Act ensured that right. So um, there's a lot of healing that has to happen in relationship to Dakota people getting to access our own plants. So I, I'd like to think that we're, I know I will probably feel more generous at some point in the future. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I think as you were saying, just uh, allowing more indigenous people to reclaim, uh, reclaim this practice um, and to um, be able to I guess also just have the access to it. I think those are things that need to be addressed first before, you know, considering, I guess, opening it. Um, and I think that's because it's such it's such a ceremonially ceremonially important plant for us. And I think 
Um, there are other plants that um, I guess can be more um, abundant and considered more abundant and not as ceremoni ceremonially sensitive as chinchasha is. Thank you so much for sharing um, those perspectives. Uh, what came to mind for me is something that my Tui Linda Black Elk always says in regards to folks asking about um, sage with uh, the crisis that we see happening right now with white sage in California being on that list of um, uh, endangered species now. She always talks about, um, did you know that rosemary, something that you can get in the grocery store, has just as many um, antimicrobial properties as sage. So when you're looking for that cleansing, burning dried rosemary can have those same effects. And so that's something that always um, crosses my mind when questions like that get asked too. Um, I imagine, or one time I was talking to an elder about you know, what if I don't have um, any chanshash and I want to lay down my offering if I go to, um, I think it's specifically like I went to Wakantipu one day and I, I just wanted to say a prayer and lay an offering and I didn't have um, any chanshash. And she told me that even if you have um, anything, if you have a tea bag, you can rip it open and pray with that tea, that mint that you have in your hand and leave that down. It's really, um, all our plants have spirit and we have spirit and it's really about those intentions. Um, and you can do that in many different ways and always like uh, follow the practices of your people. I always encourage folks to learn um, more about uh, your families and your family connections and things. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question, which is uh, someone asked if there are any other plants that have this distinctive red bark or if Chanshasha is unique in this way. Um, it's not completely unique in this way. I will say as vibrant as Chanshasha, um, no other plant gets that really, really rich, bright, vibrant red. But one that comes very close that comes to mind right now is um, uh, rose rose bushes, the wild rose bushes. Sometimes those can get very bright red um, stems as well. Those ones, um, the native roses, generally don't have thorns on them either on the stems, or they have very, very small um, thorns on them. But that is one that is kind of similar. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, with that, I just want to say Wopita Tonka, many thanks again to all of our presenters, all of LPCP staff that made this event possible, to our sponsors. Um, and I would also like to say that we are going to drop um, a very quick survey link in the chat. So please tell us um, how you how you liked the event, how we did, what we could do better. Um, it's really important for us to, to hear our community members and make sure that um, we are putting on the programming that you want to see. Um, so with that, I'm going to say Dokshta, okay, see you all later, and Wopira Tanka, many thanks for coming and um, learning about Chanshasha with us tonight. I hope you all have a great evening. Get some dinner if you haven't already. Drive home safe, all the things. Um, Oh yeah, I think we're gonna end it now. Ah, we'll be at Tanka. Doksha, okay, watch you on Thursday. Doksha.